Kevin Mitnick. Thank Hi. You. Good afternoon. Mr. Mitnick, how are you feeling? Great. Great. After the ice bar last night, really good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, we'll get back to what you do currently later. Uh, okay. But hacking today and back when you started has changed a lot. Uh, can you tell us how you started hacking phone lines in the 70s? Yeah, pretty much I started in the same hobby that Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs started in was phone freaking, and it was really about exploring the telephone network. And when I was in high school, this is when I got involved in it, and I was kind of a prankster, and I loved pulling pranks, and I loved learning about telephony, and it was amazing how you could pick up a phone and call a phone number in Australia and hear the time, or something like that, but what I loved to do was pull pranks. And one of my favorite pranks was changing a friend's home phone into a pay phone by hacking into the switch, so whenever he or his parents tried to make a call, it would say, please deposit 25 cents. <laughs> I'm sure his parents didn't appreciate it, though. Yeah. So this is kind of how I started my foot in the door of computer hacking. I actually start, started with my passion to learn about telephony. Hmm. I know you have a trick, and you had a trick. You have told us that like a thousand times, but it was named complimentary apple juice, I think. Can't you tell that story, <laughs> well, please? <laughs> well, it's kind of what was my favorite hack, and I'll just stand up to tell you, it's easier to stand yes. up. Um, my favorite hack was actually when I was a teenager, and it wasn't into a large company, it was actually into McDonald's. And you go, you know, what's he looking for, a free Big Mac? No, what I actually worked out is when customers would drive up to the drive-up window, I worked out how to take over their drive-up window through radio so I could overpower the guy wearing the headset inside the McDonald's so I could be the guy taking the order. <laughs> and you could imagine at 16 years old how fun that could be. So a customer would drive up, I would you know, take their order, I'd say, oh, you're the 100th customer today, please drive forward, your order's for free. <laughs> Somebody would drive up and I would tell, you know, they make their order Big Mac fries, Cokes, and what, whatever, and then I would say that our soda machine is broken, but we're offering complimentary apple juice. And, <laughs> and the, the customer would say, well, okay, we'll go with the apple juice. I'd say, do you want small, medium, or large? And remember, I'm 16 years old, so this is the kind of humor we had at the time. Then I'd play a recording of what sounded like peeing in a cup. It wasn't really peeing, but it sounded like that. And I'd tell them, please drive forward. You know, your order is ready. But my favorite is when the cops would drive up. Bar none. Dr cops would drive up, I'd go, hide the cocaine, hide the cocaine! <laughs> Please drive forward. Until the, the, the manager inside the McDonald's was so ups frustrated and upset and didn't understand what was going on, he walks outside, he's looking in the parking lot, trying to identify who's messing with his system, and then eventually he walks up to the drive-up window and puts his face into the speaker as if there was somebody hiding inside. <laughs> so I couldn't resist. I keep down the microphone. What the hell are you looking at? <laughs> and the guy flies back about 10 feet. So bar none, I guess that was my favorite hack of all times. Thank you, McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> But could phone hacking still be useful? It could be. I mean, uh, you know. Can uh, you show us something, maybe? Uh, you know, but, uh, you know, I can't. You know, it's a Swedish telephone system, not usually usually hacking, uh, hacking Swedish phone systems. But I could do, try to do a demo, but we need a volunteer from the audience. Yes. And the volunteer one? will have to come up here, put your cell phone so everybody can see it up on, on the screen, and uh, let me see what I can do. Any volunteers? Come on. Do you want me to pick Come someone? Come on down. What carrier, what, what operator are you on? Uh, uh, okay, we'll try it with that one. Should work with everyone here. So come on down. Simon Solnebeck. Uh. So this is his first mistake, handing me his phone. <laughs> so what we're going to do is that we're going to Place it up here, and then I'm going to ask you for your phone number here. Just give me one sec. One second. And what we want to do, just display the uh, actual phone up on the screen. 
Oh, can you make your display brighter? It's, uh, I can't see it at all. Well, I got to, I, we got to be able to see it. So what's your phone number? Your, uh, what's your cell phone number? And, wow, that's an easy number. And give me somebody who's like a friend, your, your wife, your girlfriend's phone number. I'm not going to call her, don't worry. But we're just, David? No. okay. Um, oh, seven, uh, uh, let's see, seven, three. Wait, seven and then three. three. I have to check my wife's number. <laughs> he doesn't call her much. <laughs> okay, then put your phone, well, I'll do it. I'm going to put it over here. Make sure the brightness is up here. Make sure we could all see his tweet. Okay, great. And then, <laughs> then one second, let me do something real quick. Because uh, I my Swedish is uh, not that great, so I'd actually write it down. And what we're going to do is see what happens in a second. So let's keep an eye on your cell phone. It looks like you got a text message from somebody. What? <laughs> Who was it from? Oh, is that your wife, Elsie? Yes. Well, let's see what, what did she send you. Uh, uh, turn it around so people can see it a little. Yeah. Uh, so you got to give me your passwords. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, wait, wait, wait. One second. I, I'll show one more thing with that. Is not only could I text him. Now, of course, you can imagine what a prankster could do. But imagine if somebody wanted to break into your computer systems or simply steal your financials. What if? I could determine that your CFO is on an airplane, and I have his cell phone number, I have his personal assistant's phone number, and I text the personal assistant from the CFO cell saying when Kevin calls, go ahead and release him the, the next quarter financials. What are, what are the chances that she'll do so? Especially if I tell her, oh, by the way, I'm on a plane, I'm getting on a plane right now, please don't text or call me. What are the chances? About 99.9%. .9%. But not only could you text somebody, you could actually call somebody as well, so come back up on the stage for a second. I think I have your number still. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually call his phone and I'll become his wife. Now, I won't be able to impersonate. I don't speak Swedish, but we'll give it a shot. So one moment. And if we could put the sound for the phone up on uh, speaker, that would be awesome as well. So one second. <laughs> You're nervous? Are you nervous? <laughs> Let's see what happens. Let's see. Dangerous? No. Okay, so we're going to... I have your numbers already, so let me put in my password. A little system I set up. Yeah. Welcome back, Kevin. That's me. Tell him that. So we're going to put in your phone number. We're going to put in your wife's number. Really, we are calling this number. Four, six. Nine, Sound nine. nine. And we're calling from this number. Four. Four, two, four. Okay, but thank you for using Kevin's nickname. Now, let's see who calls him. Oh, Elsie's calling you. <laughs> Might answer, see if she's around. Hello? Sure. Hey, Kevin. Hey, Kevin. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. So this type of spoofing could be used for fun and jokes, or it could be used by an attacker that wants to break into your e-commerce company, right? Because well, you know, if they could impersonate a vendor, HP, Dell, Cisco, Juniper, right? It might be trusted by somebody that's inside your company. So it actually could be used for good and evil. Okay, we have, yep. Yeah, we have uh, several bank representatives in the audience at the moment. Who, but, bankers? Yeah, bankers. But they're pretty secure nowadays, or what do you say? 
Uh, could be. I don't know about Sweden. What, what, what's one of the top banks here? Uh, like, I think that a lot of e-commerce uses Swedbank. So anybody here use Swedbank? <laughs> <laughs> we can give something a try. Hold on. Let me think. Um, I got to look up the phone number and do it real quick. One second. So Swed Bank. Um, oh, one second. Oh, here we go. It's a seven, four, six, seven, seven, one, two, two, one, two. Okay, great. So we're going to put this on speaker again, but this time I'm going to show you how phishing attacks have evolved. Before it used to be a hacker would send you a web form and try to trick you into thinking it's your, your PayPal or your bank. Now they've moved to integrated voice response systems because at least in the United States, when you call your airline, when you call your credit card company and your bank, you never reach a human being. You always re reach an integrated voice response system. So what attackers are doing today is they're setting this up to be able to intercept your credentials, meaning your accounts and your passwords and stuff. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, call Swede Bank, and I want you to look at the screen that we'll have on my Mac on here as I'm doing it. And we'll pay attention because, let's see, if you could put the Mac up on the screen, on the big one here, that would be great. The Mac, this computer. <laughs> no, not the running man. The computer! Is it? Um, one second. I just want to make sure I'm mirroring, because it might be my bad. OK. Oh, yep, mirror it. Now we see it. OK, I apologize. And I'm trying to make it a little bit bigger for you so you can actually see it. So you watch the screen as we call Swedbank. OK? So we'll give it a shot. I hope they, have an e they, they allow English. Let's see what happens. And this is the real bank. Välkommen till telefonbanken för Swedbanks och Sparbankens kunder. For English, please press 9. Cool. Du får nu fyra val. Welcome to the That's Telebank the for Swedbanks and the Savings Banks customers. You will now be given four choices. For self-service, please press 1. For personal service, self-service. Please remember to always end with a hash. Please enter your registration number or organization number. Anybody have their registration number, an authorization number I can borrow? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll just enter one through zero. It'll take some moment, there's some latency. And of course I won't recognize it. Wrong registration or organization number. Please. If I had the correct registration number, it would ask me for the pin code and I'd be able to intercept the pin code. How did this actually work? It's called man in the middle attack. When the target calls a number that's under my control. Imagine you send out a spear phishing email containing a phone number that's toll free in Sweden. And when the victim calls it, you know, it's purportedly coming from Swedbank. And when the victim calls it, they reach the integrated voice response system of the bank. The trick is it's not the real number of the bank. It's a number that the hacker has set up, a voice over IP number that forwards to a, uh, to a open software, open source software open source PBX software called Asterisk, and then the Asterisk system calls out to the real bank. So now the hacker is the man in the middle and is able to intercept account numbers, passwords, pins, or whatnot, and the victim will never know what happened. And this is how attacks are evolving with using phishing, is doing these types of man in the middle attacks. So you can sit anywhere, like... Anywhere, I can anywhere set it up. All I need is the phone number of the bank, and and then I could set up my own local number here using voice over IP, and nobody really checks that it's the real bank as long as it's a toll-free number, and it goes to the bank and the person's fooled, and they're calling me, and I'm calling the real bank, right? And to them, it's all transparent, but I'm there in the middle intercepting everything. So if I was a bad guy, I could sit at Wayne's Coffee Shop over here and do this all day and get people's passwords and account numbers and such. So okay. that's how phishing has evolved mm -hmm. from 
the old way of sending you guys like uh, web, you know, web links and a hyperlink, like a web link to like a fake site that purports to be your bank. Mm -hmm. That's the old way. This is kind of the new way. So we know that you can break into all these kinds of different systems. Well, primarily, like I, I have two jobs in my life right now. Mm -hmm. I'm a public speaker. I go around the world speaking on security. And then I have a company, we do penetration testing, which means companies hire us to try to break into their networks, manipulate their people, or get in their, their physical facilities, and to try to identify the vulnerabilities so we could tell them how to fix them. And our success rate when we're allowed to use social engineering attacks, which is when the attacker uses manipulation, deception, and influence to get a target to comply with a request, like opening up a Word doc or a PDF file, basically cooperating with the attacker. Our success rate's 100%. And usually when we're allowed to try to break in the company's web applications, it's in the high 90s, right? So that's to say that security today is really poor hmm. because pretty much every company we test, we've, since the last 14 years, we've always gotten in. Hmm. Yeah. And that's scary because yeah. you have to wonder if somebody has much more time resources, if they're you know, part of the Russian business network, they're likely going to get into. And we just heard about the Black, Black Shades malware, and it was interesting because one of the co-authors of the malware was a Swedish guy. Hmm. You know, this was in the news yesterday, all over the news, all over CNN. Hmm. And Black Shades was a piece of malware that is used to infect computers through social engineering. In other words, getting a victim to open up an attachment that's sent in an email or go visit a website that's malicious, and then that software, Black Shades, gets put onto your computer, and now the hacker basically has full control and see everything you do, all your banking passwords, and so on and so forth. Can you tell, some, uh, can you tell us something about uh, social engineering? Sure. What's and that? Social engineering is a technique where attackers manipulate people, and the best way to tell the story is go, going back about 15 years when I did an attack on a company called Motorola. I know you're familiar with a I, I know you're familiar with Nokia since they're pretty close in Finland. Motorola is one of the before Apple came out with the iPhone, Motorola was the biggest cell phone company, at least in the United States. And at that time, I was living in Denver, Colorado. I was under the name of Eric Weiss. Why Eric Weiss? Because at the time I was a federal fugitive. And Eric Weiss was the real name for my idol Harry Houdini, the magician. So I thought I'd have a sense of humor. Later on, I learned the FBI had no sense of humor. <laughs> but that's a story for another time. So I was working at this law firm, and my colleague hands me this brochure for the Microtech Ultralight cell phone. And this cell phone, here it is, if you remember it, was like the iPhone 6 of the 1990s. And for your, you know, for your Trekkie fans, it reminds me of the you know, Star Trek communicator, right? So I made a stupid and regrettable decision to go after the source code of the phone. Now, the source code to the firmware is secret. You can't buy it. It's kept internal and, and proprietary to the company. But I wanted to get the firmware because I wanted to understand how the phone worked. So what I did is I told my supervisor I needed to go to a doctor appointment, and she gave me permission to leave early, uh, early in the afternoon. And I'm in Denver, and I call... 1-800 directory assistance, that's toll free, and I ask for the phone number to Motorola Corporation. I get a phone number, I call it, I get a receptionist, and they go, hi, I'm looking for the project manager of the Microtac Ultralight. And she told me all cellular phone development was handled out of Schaumburg, Illinois. And she goes, sir, would you like their number? And I go, sure. She gave me the number, I call that uh, a different telephone number, I get a different receptionist, I go, hi, I'm looking for the project manager of the Microtac Ultralight. Then I'm transferred around, two, three, five. By the eighth time, the eighth time I'm transferred, I'm, I'm now transferred to the vice president for all of Motorola Mobility. And in these transfers, I learned that they also had a research center in Arlington Heights, Illinois. So when he got on the phone, he goes, yes, uh, this is, you know, this is so-and-so. He goes, who am I talking to? I go, this is Rick over in Arlington Heights, an R&D. I said, I'm looking for the project manager of the Microtac. And the VP says, oh, the project manager is Pam. She works for me. Would you like her extension? And I go, sure. And he gives me the extension. 
And then he goes, well, could I help you with anything? I don't know. I'll talk to Pam. Don't worry about it. So my next call is to Pam, but I don't get her. I get her greeting on her voicemail, and she told her callers that she just left on a two-week vacation, the date she was returning, and if you needed any help whatsoever, please call Alicia on extension blah, blah, blah. So who's my next call to? Alicia. So I call Alicia. She answers. I go, hey, this is Rick over in Arlington Heights. Did Pam leave on vacation yet? Oh, she has. Because she told me before she was leaving that she was going to send me the source code to the Microtac Ultralight, right? But if she went on vacation and didn't have a chance, I could always call you for help. And by this time, I'm walking down the street towards my apartment. I lived a 15-minute walk from the law firm in downtown Denver, and I'm pressing the phone to my ear really hard because there's a lot of traffic noise. Because I didn't want them to hear the traffic noise because obviously it doesn't sound like an office. So she came back with a question that I, you know, I, I never figured she'd ask. She goes, well, Rick, what version do you want? And I never even looked up the version numbers. And I thought I had to think quick on my feet. I go, how about the latest and the greatest? So she's typing on her computer for about five, six minutes, and I'm on the way walking home. And she goes, Rick, I found, I found the source code release for the, for the Microtech, but there's a problem. I go, what's the problem? She goes, there are hundreds of file directories, and within each directory, there are hundreds of files. Then I asked her, I go, do you know how to use tar and gzip? That's like WinZip under Windows, so you could put all those files into an archive? And she told me, no, she didn't know how. And I go, would you like to learn? And she said yes, so I became her instructor. So I taught her to use tar and gzip, and at the end of the lesson, we had this three megabyte file that contained the source code to the microtac. Then I asked her, I go, do you know how to use FTP? And that's file transfer program. And at the time, I, I, I never, this was all extemporaneous. I was never planning, I never plan, uh, figured that this would actually work. But fortunately, I had a good knack for re, you know, remembering you know, host names and IP addresses. So I basically told her to open up a connection to a particular IP address where I had an anonymous account. So she tries opening up a connection to send me the file, and it keeps timing out. One try, two tries, three times. And then she goes, Rick, I'm going to have to talk to my security manager about what you're asking me to do. I'll be right back. And I go, no, wait, 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 because I didn't want her to talk to anyone about what I was asking her to do. So I'm almost home, and the seconds are seeming like minutes. I'm really you know, worried that they're going to hook up a tape recorder, that that's going to be exhibit A in a court case later. So I was going to be very careful when she returned, on, you know, returned to the call. So she, about eight minutes later, she comes on. She goes, Rick. I go, uh-huh. She goes, that IP address you gave us to send the files outside of Motorola's campus. And I go, uh-huh. And she said, my security manager told me that we can't transfer files outside of Motorola's campus unless we use a special proxy server, and I don't have an account on the server. And I go, uh-huh. And I'm about to hit the end button on the cell phone, figuring, well, good try. You know, just wasted maybe 10 minutes on the phone. But she goes, Rick, I have some great news. I go, what? Well, my security manager gave me his personal username and password to the proxy server, so I'm going to upload the file to you now. So by the time I put my key to the front door of my apartment, 15 minutes from the law firm, I had the source code to the Microtech Ultralight. That's what social engineering is. <laughs> Actually, one company, I think it was Santa Cruz Operations, were so impressed by your hacking, so they, they uh, dropped a lawsuit on you if you told them. Well, what happened there is, Back you know, 20 years ago, I hacked in this company, Santa Cruz Operation. They didn't know it was me. Okay. They thought it was another company that was doing industrial espionage. So they had their lawyers draft up a lawsuit. And when they figured out, oh, it's just this guy you know, hacking for the challenge, they basically dropped it because I'm not like some guy they can come after and sue. Mm. You were put in jail in 1988? Yes. I was actually arrested and put into federal custody. And I'll tell you an interesting story is I was expecting to get bail. When you're arrested in the States, mm. and you know, I, I know in Sweden you have a different system because I've been paying attention to Julian Assange's saga. Mm -hmm. And when you're arrested, you get, you get a right to bail in the mm. States. And I remember in court, 
the prosecutor tells the judge, not only do we have to hold Mr. Mitnick in custody because he's such a danger to the world, we have to make sure he can't get to a telephone. Mm. And what the prosecutor went on and said, if Mr. Mitnick gets access to a phone in the jail, he'll dial up to NORAD and whistle into the phone and talk to their modem and launch a nuclear weapon. <laughs> I started laughing in court because I never heard something so absurd in my life. But the judge, not being technical, actually believed it and I ended up being held in solitary confinement for yeah. a year. And how or, was that? Or, oh, that was fun. <laughs> oh. a, lot of time, a lot of time for sleep. <laughs> but how did you manage that mentally? Uh, you just adapt. I mean, what, how do prisoners of war manage their situations? You, you just have to adapt and it's you know, really tough and it's uncomfortable. But, you know, it just, I adapted, I got through it. Mm. Did a lot of reading, a lot of sleeping. They let me actually have an AMF, uh, a Walkman radio, mm. which I was surprised because I figured they, were gonna, they thought I could, you know, somehow tune into something into their frequencies. But uh, so I used to listen to the radio and stuff like that and work on my case. Mm. After some time, you discovered that FBI chased you. How did you discover that? Well, when I was a fugitive, when I, <laughs> I did some <laughs> crazy things. When, when the government tried to come after me using this informant, I, I figured it out kind of quickly and I hacked into the cellular phone provider. And back in those days, there were only two in Los Angeles because this was old technology. There was the wireline and wireless. And I knew uh, which, which cell phone number belonged to the informant. So I hacked into the cell system so I could look at the call detail records. Mm -hmm. And what call detail records are is anybody, anytime you make an outgoing or incoming call, it's metadata. It's basically this whole story about the NSA, how they're using metadata to keep track of people. I was doing this in the 90s. So what I did is I searched for anybody that was calling this informant guy, right? Because I wanted to know who his circle of you know, friends were and who he's communicating with. And it turned out to be the FBI. Mm. And I uncovered the guy that was like the uh, senior agent and all the people that were on this team called the White Collar Crime uh, Squad. And I figured, oh, that's interesting. Right? So why don't I set up a system, I set up with a computer, a scanner, and a special device back in those days that if any of those phone numbers came into where my location to the cell site that I was close to, my computer would alert me. And at the time I was working as a private investigator mm. and I set this contraption up and for weeks nothing ever happened. Mm. Then one day I drove into the office and I walked in my office and the computer was beeping and I look at the computer and my early warning system had tripped that one of the FBI cell phones was in the neighborhood. Mm. So I go, that's interesting, because I just came from my house. Mm. You know, I wasn't trying to hide. Everyone knew where I was living. Um, they obviously weren't there to arrest me. They know where I work. And I was thinking, they were there two hours earlier. What were they doing at my house? And the only thing I could think of is that they were getting a description of my apartment to get a search warrant, mm. because that's what they have to do in the States. They have to actually get a description. So, oh, okay, so they're going to come search me. This guy's kind of nice to know beforehand, by the way. So, obviously, I go to my house, I, bring, I take my computer equipment and peripherals, I put it at a friend's house, but, you know, I'm the ultimate prankster, right? So I, I, you know, so I go over to Winchell's Donut House, I get an assorted dozen donuts, when with a Sharpie, I write FBI donuts on the box. <laughs> and then in the refrigerator, I put the refrigerator because I don't want them to get stale, in case it takes two days for them to show up. Mm -hmm. And on a big post-it note outside the refrigerator, you know how it says Intel inside? Mm. I wrote it the same way, FBI donuts inside. <laughs> so they, they actually showed up the next day, or very early in the morning, and they raided my apartment. They couldn't find anything that was electronic, right? Except maybe a, a, a radio. And they're like going, wow, you know, how come nothing is here? And then they see it on the refrigerator. You know what? They didn't even eat one. <laughs> I, I waited, but they were pretty pissed off. So that's why when they eventually caught me, you know, you know, they didn't like my pranks too much, so they came down pretty hard on me. But the FBI okay. chased you for two years. About, two, about three years, yeah. Two How three. were you able to escape for so long? Well, uh, I worked legitimate jobs. I was able to create new identities for myself. And I figured I would just get off the grid. And I, you know, I didn't use my skills for stealing and making money to support myself. What I did was I got a job at a law firm, a job at a hospital, and basically earned revenue. But my downfall 
is I couldn't stop the hacking. It was so addictive to me and so entertaining. Like, you probably have kids that get addicted to video games. I would say that's very analogous, right? And I would just love, you know, doing this stuff. And then eventually, they were able to track my location. Mm. Uh, you were talking about it a little bit now, but you, I've seen uh, uh, interviews and a movie about you, and you claim in both of these um, um, interviews, or in the movie as well, that you never stole anything, still. Well, I stole phone time and source code, yeah. but it wasn't... But my goal was, was to become the best hacker at finding ways through security. That was my end game. But in doing so, I used to use phone services that weren't mine to make it so I couldn't be traced, right? It wasn't just, you know, I could have made a local call to the internet for free, but instead I routed it through the cell phone system using other, you know, using other services that I was obviously theft of services wasn't the purpose of saving the money to make the free call. It was to make it very difficult in tracking my location. So you could have uh, hacked bank systems and whatever. And yeah, get yeah. Filthy rich and move to that wasn't my, island. My goal wasn't did. to hack banks. My goal was to learn all about security, all about the telephone system, to become really good at getting in. Hmm. And, you know, kind of what I do today, I haven't stopped hacking. I, do it, I, I was doing it in my room last night. The difference is... <laughs> So We're I would check your laptops, laptop. check your phones later. No, but, you know, I do it with authorization. So companies hire me, and they give me permission to do the same thing I was doing for 30 years mm. and say, find all our vulnerabilities because we want to fix them before the real bad guys get in. Mm. They, and that's what, exactly what I do. So it's kind of like Pablo Escobar becoming a pharmacist. <laughs> <laughs> but eventually, the FBI found you. Eventually. With the help from a Mr. Shimomura. Satomo Shimomura, yeah. yes. Tell us about him. Well, I, I remember I was really interested in the source code of cell phone handsets. And at the time, him and another guy named Mark Lauder were working on reverse engineering the Oki 900 and Oki 1150 cell phones. These are old technology. And I suspected they had the source code. So after hacking into Lauder, Mark Lauder, this other guy, he was a, actually a co-defendant. This is kind of an interesting circle of this other hacker named Kevin Polson, who's now the editorial director of Wired. He was another famous hacker. But anyway, I found out about this guy, Shimomura. So I hacked into his machine to basically under, see if he had the source code to the Okies and found so, a whole bunch of other interesting stuff. So then it started him off on now tracking me back because he was pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> right? I, pissed the guy, I pissed the wrong guy off is what I did. And then he helped the government uh, capture me. But they put you, put you in solitary confinement again. Yes. Yeah, How they, was that the second oh, time? Oh, it was great. You know, it's like a vacation. <laughs> no, no. It's, 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 imagine it's like going into your restroom at home and just locking the door and you can't leave the bathroom. Mm. Yeah, it's just, you know, again, it was, you know, the, why I was a hacker was for the intellectual curiosity, the seduction of adventure, and the pursuit of knowledge. Mm. Those were basically my drivers, mm. and I was a little bit insane back in those years mm. where I take all these risks to do this, what I considered a hobby at the time. It wasn't about damaging computers, writing viruses, worms, trojans, or stealing. It was more about playing the game of getting in. But what was the charges against you? Well, computer hacking, wire fraud, computer fraud, using access mm -hmm. devices. All these charges were really about, you know, there's no charge called computer hacking. Mm -hmm. They label it under different federal statutes. Mm -hmm. um, when you got out the last time, when you were released in 2000, the last time, you were not allowed to, to use the internet at all. Oh, I wasn't allowed to touch anything electronic. <laughs> if it had a transistor radio, it was like, I wasn't allowed to have a 9-volt battery and duct tape, right? Like <laughs> MacGyver, because the government <laughs> was really worried that I was going to do something. So I had to get permission of the government to get a cell phone, to use a fax machine. I mean, these conditions were so broad, and what, what was interesting is after two years, I was commissioned to write this book on social engineering called The Art of Deception. And I went to the government and said, listen, I'd like to get this word processor. It doesn't have a connect modem. It doesn't have connection to the internet. Back in these days, it was dial-up, right? And, uh, and, and the probation officer said, listen, we're going to give you permission to get a laptop. Uh, you know, I pinched myself like, am I dreaming? And he goes, yeah, but you have to promise us you're not going to use the internet and uh, we could, like, from time to time take a look at it. But he says, the, there's one condition that's the most important. 
I go, okay, what's that? He goes, that you don't tell anyone like the media. So as long as I kept it a secret, I was allowed to have a computer after two years. Mm -hmm. And then it all expired in 2003. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you had to pay a fine for four thousand dollars. No, that was restitution. Oh, okay. okay. That was restitution. But tell us about that story. Well, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. When you're in federal prison in the states, they give you an ID card that's like it looks like an ATM card. And so, <laughs> when I got out, I auctioned it on eBay because I thought it would be funny, actually, right? And and actually, it was going up in value. And then eBay actually yanked it off their auction saying, this doesn't meet our community standards, right? Because they didn't like the idea. And then it be, CNN, it was covered by CNN and Fox, you know, that they yanked my card. And then a bunch of auction houses contacted me. We'll list it on our site. So it went up in value to like four grand. Then I went and sold it to some guy in Spain for 4,000. And then I went into the probation department and paid the whole restitution right from the selling their own prison ID card. Mm -hmm. Again, they weren't happy about it. I thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so we know that you can um, hack into all the systems, but you can't break into a building, right? Uh, break what? Break into a building. It's you Buildings? Hacking is well, actually, I was hired by a bank, a very large bank in the United States, to actually not only break in through technology, but to see if I can get into their data centers. And we were able to, we're able to do it. Our team was able to breach the bank's data center, not, their, not the vaults where the money is, but actually where all the servers are. And that was through breaking, uh, breaking their physical security. In fact, here in Sweden, do you guys have access cards with what uh, looks like a device like this? Uh, a device like this, and they're usually called HID cards. You guys have like these white cards? to get into your building? Do they have that here in Sweden? Yes. Okay, great. Well, imagine you wear this badge, people wear it around their neck, they put it in their wallet, and they wear it around their hip. Now, if I get close enough to your card, I could power up your card and steal the information to become you, right? So let me actually show you how that works. Just test this, to make sure this is hooked up. So as a, oh, if you could put the Mac up there, great. So so I have these different hid cards, access cards, and as I swipe them through the reader, you'll see a different a card ID and site ID. Those are the magic numbers. So if a bad guy gets your card ID and site ID, what they could use is they could use this device, they hook up to their Windows machine, and they could write a brand new card and essentially have the same card that you're carrying on your hip. That's bad because then they could become you and just get access to the building, right? So, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you basically how I was able to compromise this bank. So this is gonna look like a, a device you don't wanna carry on an airplane. That's okay. I'm gonna show you how this works. And then I'm gonna do the setup. Second. This, I put on a little, uh, you know, bread, uh, you know, where I could put the devices here with the straps, this cocoon thing. And basically, this is an antenna. This is what they call a Proxmark III, and this is a battery pack, right? That looks suspicious. But if I arm it, what I'm going to do here now is I'm, it's now in a mode, if it gets close to somebody's card, it actually captures their credentials. But it doesn't look suspicious if I put it into this. I put it into this, right? So I'm just walking and, you know, here people are at Starbucks or Wayne's Coffee on their coffee break, and I want to steal their, card, their creds. Well, if I get close to them in line, I just walk by them, it steals it. Or better yet, on a smoke break, people have a smoking area outside their building, you can say, oh, I'm Kevin, nice to meet you. And as you're shaking the person's hand and looking them into the eye, this gets about one inch from their card because right? they're not paying attention. It's called misdirection. They use that in magic. So basically, I'll take this out of here for a second. And you'll see lights here, I don't know, but as the card gets close to the antenna, the light goes off. It only takes a second. So right now, it's actually read the card. So this card, which is 19786, is now stored in the memory of this device. So all I have to do is hit play mode, and now this 
device is your card. So I swipe this, it's the same card. So basically, I clone the card to this device. Now, what I could do is use this device, which I showed you earlier, and write my own card, right? But you gotta think, well, now the bad guy has to get an inch or two away from me. I'll, you know, I'm gonna be careful from now on, right? That's what you're thinking. But we work on better technologies. Actually, let me show you. This thing is the big hid card reader. <laughs> so you put this in a little bag, you know, like a, like a backpack. This reads cards up to three feet away. Three feet. How easy is it to get three feet away from somebody wearing their security card if it's in their wallet, right? And what this does, this device has a micro SD card. So basically, I can put this in a backpack and I could walk around your building or in your building or near your smoke break, or people in a smoke break, and it will capture their card up to three feet away. So I'm right over here. I know you can't see it. Oh, on camera. Can you put the camera up? Maybe you could see it on the camera, if we're lucky. We could put the camera, there, it's kind of the thing. If I get like this far away, it read the card from all the way up there. See, it just displayed it, right? So now the, now the bad guys could be three feet away from you or one meter, and they'll be able to steal your card credentials, clone them, and get access to your building. So this is exactly what we used this is the exact technique that we use to breach a very large bank in the States and get access to their data centers because once we had the cards, now we had access to the building. How did we get access to the building when other people are there and we would not be recognized? Simple. Found out when the janitorial crew cleaned the building, they disabled the alarm to the bank because we don't have the alarm codes. Then we walk in with our cards and the other employees assume we're legit because we have access cards. And even we told the janitorial service, oh, when you leave the building, tell us first because uh, uh, we want to leave before you. And they weren't suspicious about that, but the whole idea is so they could arm the alarm again. So that is actually how we were able to do it. So breaking physical security is something else we do, and it's quite easy. I will never use cards and phones again. <laughs> yeah. Never. Well, it's funny, I was just doing a, a talk for Citrix and Palo Alto Networks, and an audience member, I, mean, I asked, anyone here have a HID card? He goes, yeah, you could use my HID card. And then I, I, I cloned it on stage, and then I go, oh, you work for, what company do you work for? And he immediately <laughs> took his badge off <laughs> and hit it. <laughs> okay, another question. What are the biggest challenges for company security, security online these days? Like well, I mean, you're all in the e-commerce business, yeah. and every time an e-commerce company hires my company, we find vulnerabilities in the web app application. We find vulnerabilities that allow us to steal other customer data, yeah. or even to the point where we could get into the server, and then from there get to the server that holds what we call the, the SQL database, and that's where a lot of customer information is stored. All your customer information, maybe even credit card information for reusable, if you want to do a reoccurring billing, that's usually kept, and usually because of PCI DSS, which is a standard by MasterCard and Visa, you have to encrypt the card numbers in these databases so you feel safe. Some bad guy gets in, our card data is encrypted, I'm following the standard, I'm good. Mm -hmm. But the problem is a lot of the companies, especially small, medium-sized e-commerce businesses, keep the keys, to the, the secret keys, to anything that's encrypted on the actual server itself. So you do, the application has to have access to be able to encrypt, decrypt, mm. right? It's not a one-way hash. So the hacker will easily go in, find the key, and decrypt everything on the, on the victim's system and then transfer it all out. I guess you all heard of the target breach recently, right? This is where a partner company, a HVAC company, had access to Target's network, all right? And you have to think about what other business partners you have then once the attackers got into their network, then they were able to spread out into Target, all right, and actually compromise the point of sale devices, mm -hmm. put in malware into the point of sale devices, which usually don't, they usually don't, ha you know, have antivirus software or that type of stuff, and were able to capture cards mm -hmm. for months, mm -hmm. 
right? They were able to actually put malicious software on the point of sale. And these guys were professionals. They probably got the Verifone device on eBay or pretended to be a customer called Verifone, that's the, pro, uh, the, the vendor, got the device and actually tested this in-house or in their laboratory before actually deploying the malware out into the real world mm -hmm. because it's a big money. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. You got a gift from Steve Wozniak. I did. Can you tell yeah. us about that? Yeah, when I got, <laughs> when I was, when I was um, completed my probation, uh, they actually televised it on a show called Tech TV that was hosted by Leah Lepore and Patrick Norton. And Steve Wozniak came and he gave me my getting, <laughs> getting off probation MacBook was actually a, a MacBook G4. And what was the coolest thing about the gift, he actually had some, you know, had the wrapping paper around it. Oh, and that's what was on the wrapping paper. That was kind of cool. I mean, he actually had an artist draw that. So instead of trying to get the key from the dog, I'm trying to get to the laptop, uh, the computer. So, I'm so uh, proud that we had you as a guest, Kevin Mitnick. Give a big hand it. for Kevin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for Thank having you. me. Thank you. Oh, and one thing. Wait. I actually brought a gift for everybody, but I don't know when, you know, maybe later I could hand it out because there might be a speaker after me. But this is my business card. And what's cool about my business card, yeah, it has my contact information like everybody else's, but what's cool about my business card, it's actually a lockpick set. <laughs> so if you lock yourself out of your home or your office, think of Kevin Mitnick and I'll open the door for you. <laughs> so I have these for you. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin.